Hello world, and welcome to the second episode of the Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Mitchell, along here with my co-host, Sarah Mitchell. This week, um, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency, so digital money for the digital age. Um, And just to find like an entry point into the topic, just being a regular person who is not very familiar with cryptocurrency, are how we approach money as a society has changed over time drastically. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to look like cryptocurrency is kind of edging into that space as far as potentially being the next um, big thing as far as our currency is concerned, which is, it's kind of jarring to think about because we're used to having paper money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's something that we're familiar with. You can hold, I mean, now we're getting more into, you know, we have credit cards and money is kind of on the back burner mentally for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. Um, younger people, I would say. Um, so we already think of maybe our money in form of ones and zeros because it's just numbers that we can see digitally in our bank accounts. Um, so maybe cryptocurrency wouldn't be so far of a leap for us, but maybe for um, our parents to understand because they're more understanding of phys- having physical money or even having gold. Correct. Um, So can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly is cryptocurrency? Got you. So uh, uh, first, I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, By by no means am I a financial expert. Um, I'm just somebody that loves cool technology, right? Um, So I guess the best understanding uh, that I have of cryptocurrency is uh, through the vein of Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is one of the biggest players in the game right now as far as cryptocurrency is concerned. Um, And Bitcoin in and of itself um, was just an innovative way uh, to take a new approach to our our currency system, right? How we exchange um, uh, items or exchange um, uh, the medium by which we're exchanging for goods and services. Exactly. Yes, yes. The medium by which we are exchanging. So uh, uh, back in 2002. Right, uh, Satoshi, uh, excuse me, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, he created a big, basically a tech technology that um, allowed people to uh, trade digital currency, right? Digital, uh, basically bits and bytes, right? So if we take it from the from the frame point of how your current banks are uh, are, are organizing your bank accounts, right now you can't really feel all the money that is in your bank account. You just Open up your, uh, open up your mobile phone, open up your mobile phone app, or go to your website, put in your credentials, and you see those numbers that represent the physical cash that you have in the bank. Well, Bitcoin is a little bit of the same. It's a representation of money, right? Bitcoin is uh, uh, one of two things. It, it oh, excuse me, uh, 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 both things. Bitcoin is a way to save your money. Uh, through investment because it's similar to real estate or similar to stocks and bonds, right? Okay. Um, to where it's a, a, a fixed asset that appreciates over time, right? So the reason why we loved money so much uh, uh, back, back in the day uh, from what history tells us is because our money used to be backed on gold, right? Something that was tangible, something that we could hold on to. It was backed by gold and silver. And back in the day, we were able to go to the banks and exchange our paper Good money. Our, first, because it's supposed to represent a certain amount of gold. Correct. That's in theory. Correct, correct. Um, and so, you know, we talk about the concept of the gold standard and that, you know, a certain amount of gold equaled um, a, a certain dollar value, right? So people were very content with that standard, but it, 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 uh, it not crippled the economy, but it basically put a ceiling on certain economies. War crippled the economy. (laughs) Let's be real. War crippled the economy. So Mm -hmm. the concentration of gold was not as distributed throughout the world. When we're referring to um, World War I, World War II, when the U.S. was manufacturing a lot of weapons and all these different things and supplying other European countries, Mm -hmm. the U.S. accumulated a large majority of that gold. Mm-hmm. So at that point in history, 
where a lot of economies in Europe were crashing as a result of you know being broke from trying to finance war mm -hmm. the u.s had all this gold so they were still on the gold standard mm -hmm. so as a society as a global society we started moving away from the gold standard and uh, using the u.s dollar to you know to back other currencies as opposed to like gold the mineral asset mm -hmm. and so um you know moving from the gold standard basically meant putting our our uh, gold, our reserves of gold in uh, central banks. And, you know, we talk about uh, the difference between uh, uh, centralized and decentralized uh, uh, currency, right, in banking systems. Would so, Bitcoin be a decentralized currency? Yes, Bitcoin okay. is a decentralized currency. So, so the difference is, so when we talk about central banks, there's only a select few um, in a group who basically dictate what the dollar is, is, is valued. Right, um, they Sarah, control the market. They, they basically control the market. Yes. So Sarah was talking about uh, getting off the gold standard. So um, when Richard Nixon, um, I believe that was in nineteen, I believe that was in nineteen seventy one or seventy four. Um, but when Richard Nixon nineteen seventy one nineteen seventy one when Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard, we were able to then just print more money. And what I mean by that is that the dollars that were then printed after we uh, were removed from the gold standard were no longer backed by any commodity. They weren't backed by anything physical. They were backed by just our belief. Okay, I'll say that again. They were backed by our belief that this money, what we call um, a fiat currency. Okay, fiat currency is basically just currency that um, is government issued, but is not backed by an actual commodity. Okay, it only has value because we believe that it has value. It's okay? only the means by which we trade, not exactly. it, there, it doesn't have value in and of itself. Yes, yes, yes. So when, you know, if we go all, all the way back, right, our, our first means of, of um, uh, doing commerce was the bartering system, right? If you had some things that I needed, I had some things that you needed, we were able to figure out a trade on that for goods and services. We then moved to then um, putting using value- Using gold as an intermediary. Using gold, but then not only using other commodities, right? Such as, um, you know, at one time salt was more valuable than gold. The reason being, right, money only has to have three characteristics, okay? Only has to have three characteristics. It has to be durable, okay? It has to be something that can last over time. Hard it to has, destroy. It has to be hard to destroy. It has to be hard to acquire. Right, so it has to be difficult for people to get get their hands on it, and it has to be something that once we get those two things taken care of, we have to be able to put some type of value on it after we know that it's durable and we know that it's difficult to procure. Right, so things like for a time it was difficult for people to uh, no, excuse, excuse me, it was difficult for countries to procure salt. Right, so the countries that had the largest reserves of salt, they were able to increase the price on the salt because the demand for it was high and the supply was low. Mm, okay. It's all about supply and demand. Supply and demand applies to every single market, right? So then we look at um, other things besides gold and silver. There was uh, a country um, in- Cows. Cows uh, are used as currency. Cows were used Cowry as currency. Cowrie shells Cowry. were used as currency. Mm -hmm. um, stones, and, and you're referring to, stones. there's an island, uh, I can't remember. It, I it's South it's, Pacific. I believe it's Yap. I believe. It, I, believe I can't the remember Yap. the name, but uh -huh. they use circular stones mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. their currency. Correct. So circular limestones that did not move, but the people believed that these limestones mm -hmm. had value, so they were able to trade off of the uh, uh, the size and weight of these different limestones. Right. So we've been able to creatively find different ways to uh, uh, trade. Right to be able to do commerce with various different mediums, right? So Bitcoin is just another medium, correct? So current, to speak, yes, to current, facilitate trade, exactly, current, and or as a fixed asset because I think you touched on that a little bit earlier. Yes, you were comparing it to real estate. Correct, correct. Does that part, the fixed asset part, does that apply because there's only so much Bitcoin? Is twenty one million? Yes. So, um, so back to uh, currency is just something. Uh, uh, that is a medium of exchange, right? And that can be, we, we've seen that that can be anything. Bitcoin is now just a digital representation of that, 
right? I'm pretty sure uh, the people watching this video and, and, and listening, uh, you've done transactions over Cash App or Venmo or through Zelle or through um, a ATH, uh, right? So you've been able to send digital money for the last five to seven years. We're right? not that far removed. We're not that we far removed. We do it removed. every day. The same, <laughs> the, that same concept has now been applied to an actual software structure, okay? And what I mean by that, so that software structure, the, uh, uh, the decentralized component of Bitcoin, right? Uh, wait, no, let's, let's put a tag right in that. I want to get to uh, what you said about the fixed asset before I get into telling you how, uh, how it what, works. What, yeah, yeah, before how it works. So Bitcoin right now is a way for you to save your money, okay? If you put your physical fiat money, right, the money that's in your pocket, right, those dollars and cents, if you put those dollars and cents into the bank, two things. The bank is going to tell you that they're able to provide you with interest on the money that you put in, and they're going to tell you that your money is insured, okay? Up to a certain amount. Those two things. Now, the caveat with those two things is, one, the first, the money that you put in, the, uh, 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 the interest that is gained from that, that interest is not beating inflation. So your dollar is worth less over time. Exactly. So if you put $50,000 into the bank here in 2020, in 2020, tw in 2025, you'll probably have depreciated 20 to 25% of that sum of money, right? Your money is not able to, uh, uh, is not able to beat inflation yes you will make money by being in there but you're going to lose money if you compare it to the inflation and, and inflation is basically just the the tax that merchants sellers have to uh pay to be able to provide goods right so right now i'm gonna compare this to the um uh, uh to the tech repair market right now due to COVID, right a lot of our parts come from the manufacturing sites in asia in the middle east um, in other countries. Right now, due to COVID, there's been a lot of manufacturing uh, uh, factories that have been closed. So for me to be able to provide parts to my customers here in my shop, it's been very difficult for me to get my hands on parts. I've had to uh, stock up on inventory because for the last eight months, part supplies have been very, very low. However, because those part supplies have been low, I've had to pay more money for the parts that I am able to get my hands on. Right, so we go back. There's to more it. demand, lower supply. It applies to every market. Bitcoin is a way for you to save your money. Sarah was talking about uh, uh, Bitcoin only being uh, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. A reason why we put gold and silver as uh, as the backing of our money because gold and silver are some of the most durable metals over time. They're very difficult to acquire. And now, since they met those those two uh, 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 those two properties, we can now apply a value to them. So that's why we've been using gold. But what if more gold came into the market? Like a lot. We're not talking about oh, we discovered uh, <laughs> some gold here, some gold there. Like a, a huge the flood the market with yes. gold. So uh, um, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine who is a traditional investor and uh, I brought up the point of of uh, Elon Musk of uh, Jeff Bezos of of uh, Jack Dorsey right if they got together and they were able to come to procure a one either more gold from an off-site location what I mean by off-site location you know a comet that's passing earth or somewhere on the moon or Mars right or two they're able to find another metal in abundance and mass abundance that is more precious than gold right so not saying that Bitcoin is a um, direct competitor to gold it is just another option right gold still has its value but now as we're moving more into a digital age right we're moving more into a, di a digital age to where our value is transitioning from things that are physical to things that are safe and encrypted and that are more durable over time so mm -hmm. yes gold has its value now and i believe that investing in gold is still 
very, very promising. However, gold does not have a fixed amount. Uh, we were just reading an, an article where they were finding um, large amounts of gold over in the Congo. In the Republic of the Congo, yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, I, it, I was talking to my colleague and he said that this is something that happens all the time. They found, find more gold more reserves. More gold reserves, yeah. But it's still our belief that it's a fixed amount. It's just the belief. We can't verify how much gold is actually on the earth or available around us. So what if we transitioned our belief into something that was actually fixed? that could not change over time. And that's where Bitcoin Bitcoin comes in. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that were made. That number is hard coded into the system. When you say made, oh, it's coded into the system. It's okay. coded into the system that you can only make, right? The system is only going to make 21 Bitcoins, right? Those Bitcoins are just strings of numbers. They're digital representations of money, right? Just like your digital uh, uh, your digital accounts are with your bank accounts, right? But in the system, there's only 21 million of them that are made, okay? Because of this fixed number, we go back to those three characteristics. Bitcoin is durable. One, because it is on an encrypted network of computers, and our computers are becoming much more durable and more durable over time as far as a network is concerned. The network, and we'll talk a little bit about here in just a moment, is the blockchain. And that's the network of the shared information, the open shared information of what is in the what, okay. what, what is in Bitcoin, the transactions that are actually there. You're going so, to say, sir? Yeah, the blockchain technology, this is what makes Bitcoin work. This is what classifies it more or less as a decentralized currency, yes. how the blockchain is structured. Yes. So so we go back to those characteristics. It, it meets durability. Then we talk, we, we talk about it being difficult to obtain. So the blockchain, the blockchain is the technology that Bitcoin is built on. And, and the blockchain is basically just a digital ledger, right? Basically, if you could see all the transactions at one time that chase or Wells Fargo was making in a day, if you could click on a button on a website and see all of those transactions in a public forum, that's basically what the blockchain is. And uh, what we call Bitcoin miners are basically just people who have really, really uh, uh, smart computers that are able to crunch numbers at a very, very high rate. Supercomputers. Right? Okay. These supercomputers, right, are connected on a network to computers all over the world. Every single one of these computers is called a node. That node has a public registry, right? A public ledger that is uh, uh, shared amongst everybody on the network. Everybody, everybody has, has to have the same copy. Everybody That's has a copy. That's why it's so secure. Mm -hmm. And as the transactions move, as they keep continuing on the network, every node has to agree that these transactions are valid. And once a group, right, let's say um, a group of maybe 50 transactions are put together, once that can be confirmed by one of the nodes, that's what we call um, the Bitcoin miners uh, getting a payout. They're able to uh, uh, get Bitcoin from the work that they're doing on the blockchain. I'll, I'll say it a different way. The accountants, that work at the your local bank have to go through these transactions that you make on a daily basis to make sure that the money leaving your account is the correct money going into somebody's account and vice versa. People get paid to do that. Bitcoin miners are doing the same thing on the blockchain with Bitcoin. They are using their computers to do the work of verifying these transactions. Because it's coming in some like complicated, it's coming encrypted in some, mm -hmm. math problem. Yes, so we'll save the uh, more deeper conversation about encryption and hash and hash values and such for a later conversation. But basically the Bitcoin miners have to solve a complex problem to be able to verify their group of transactions, transactions to be able to connect it on the chain right so just think about blocks connected with chains it's like a daisy moving chain forward. daisy chain chain of blocks so you're trying to get your computer to put your block on the network and excuse me on on the blockchain and if you can successfully do that 
then you get a payout as a Bitcoin miner. Right now, it's it's six point uh, six point two five or six point five, six point two five or six point five Bitcoin per uh, block that you're able to verify and add to the blockchain. That is happening every ten minutes. This has been happening since two thousand two. Uh, Bitcoin miners used to be paid 50 Bitcoin per block they were able to verify and they were able to do it from just their personal computers. Now, in 2021, it takes supercomputers, which consume massive amounts of energy to be able to verify these transactions. And so now, over time, it's become more difficult to mine. And so now the payout is only six Bitcoin or six, 6.2. But one Bitcoin is Bitcoin. like 50 grand. So I want to stop right here because mm -hmm. I think we have an opportunity for us here in the Virgin Islands because of our positioning on this beautiful planet. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of renewable energy at our disposal, at our disposal, mm -hmm. solar energy, hydroelectric energy potential, but untapped, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, what amount of energy does it take to run these supercomputers? Is it a viable opportunity okay so if you think about the amount of power it takes to power a a, a standard one-story house is about this and to, to power that one-story house in a day is about the same amount of power that supercomputer uh needs to be able to mine efficiently in a day okay so let's say i have solar panels on my house mm -hmm. and I have a great surplus you know it's summertime i have a great surplus because there's a lot of you know sunlight mm -hmm. Um, re on a regular day, I would be giving this money back to WAPA. Mm -hmm. It would be going back into the grid. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that if I have so much of a surplus to run this supercomputer, I could just be making um, Bitcoin. I could just be accumulating Bitcoin by bit mining. So two, so two things. One, um, or would this be more scalable to like a business building that has yeah. solar so, panels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one, one, there has to be, well, the Virgin Islands is in a prime point because the supercomputer needs massive amounts of power. Renewable energy uh, and the opportunities here on the Virgin Islands are quite vast, in my opinion. The ability to uh, uh, procure energy from the sun, where we are positioned so close to the equator, and with um, our areas that may not be as covered, there mm -hmm. there is potential of an investment to be put into more renewable energy sources to be able to potentially mine Bitcoin or create another sustainable uh, cryptocurrency potentially here on the island that is mine oh, right here on the island. You know, Akon creates in his own city in Africa and he's created his own you know? type of cryptocurrency for his city. Exactly. So, you know, we talk about, you know, I'm a big proponent. Um, I have uh, one of my heroes here, Nikola Tesla here on my wall and we talk about free energy, right? And we talk about our ability to be able to move and grow as, as a society um, uh, with our ability to power our technology in efficient ways and be power sustainable. and be sustainable, right? To where we are not paying astronomical prices just to keep our lights on in 2021, right? Elect the cost of electricity drives up the cost of rent, drives, drives up the cost of goods. <laughs> right. And so, and so we look to now um, concepts that Nikola was talking about in the early 1900s. Um, we see those concepts now coming back. You know, I've flown over to Amsterdam, over to the Netherlands, and I've seen uh, in the sea where there's uh, uh, rows of, of uh, wind turbines sitting in the sea that power 40 to 50% of the energy needed in Denmark. Well, why can't that be? You know, the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Oh, You're talking about Amsterdam. Excuse me, excuse me. And in um, in the Netherlands, so why can't why can't that be done here, right? Why can't there be more businesses um, and more houses that are able to have or get access to high quality solar panel setups as a general installation in, into the house? There's a finite amount of people here in the Virgin Islands that to quantify this solution, um, in my opinion. Um, just takes 
just takes some effort and just takes um, uh, an, an open mind to something that is um, progressive, progressive, embracing innovative. new technologies yes. and not being afraid that change is going to be like you have to let go to some extent mm-hmm. what okay let's say it ain't broke why fix it that's a lot you know a lot of people say that but it's like we don't have to struggle as a society like Mm -hmm. a lot of the woes that we have we have the brain power to solve it you know we just have to stop fighting with each other Mm -hmm. so so to get back to bitcoin mining right there there are tons of people who are uh in the states and all over the world who are building mining farms. And what, my, and what I mean by mining farms, they're building facilities that are connected to renewable energy sources, whether it be solar power, hydro, hydroelectric power, wind power, um, to be able to power these supercomputers because they believe, right? Just like we believed in gold, we believed in salt, we believed in limestone, we believe that this cryptocurrency is gonna be here to stay. And we believe that over time- Blockchain even deeper than that blockchain it's is good that technology is gonna change a lot of things because if i need we didn't even get to talk about public or private keys mm-hmm. and how that works within the blockchain mm-hmm. framework mm-hmm. but looking at outside of bitcoin and applying that to medical records mm-hmm. um more sensitive government documents where mm-hmm. i can keep my things encrypted and safe mm-hmm. and not have to worry about somebody you know hackers getting access to my sensitive data mm-hmm. um because you know we talked about privacy a little bit in the first episode like it, it continues here mm-hmm. um can we talk a little bit about how public and private keys work within blockchain um yes so generally right um, and this was a little bit of the conversation that I was having with my colleague, colleague as well. Um, his concern was the the corruption uh, of Bitcoin and the blockchain, or uh, the users um, that he believes um, are on the blockchain, or excuse me, are that are using Bitcoin or that are using cryptocurrency to launder their money for nefarious purposes for nefarious purposes right so yes you know being 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 transparent there there are those out there that are using the anonymity of the blockchain to be able to uh, put their money in a discrete format right in a way that people can't tell uh, that i own on the ledger it's just a string of numbers there's nobody's names Mm -hmm. it's just so one two three four cent yes. four five six so that is the example of a public key right when you uh get on to the or when you start to buy big bitcoin you create for yourself a public key and this public key is just a strings of a string of letters and numbers and it's a way for people to identify you by that string of letters and numbers it doesn't identify any personal data this is just your personal um, unique strings, string of letters and numbers. The private key is your own personal key. It is the only it is your string, a different, unique uh, a string of letters and numbers that you only have, right? So think of this as uh, maybe like your um, uh, your bank account password, right? It's something that you only have. So uh, with this private key, that unlocks your cryptocurrency and unlocks your ability to change your level of cryptocurrency whether you increase your number or decrease your number that can only though those things can happen but when we talk about we bring it back to the the bitcoin miners they have to validate right so let's say for example i wanted to send sarah uh five bitcoin right i would need her public address right to be able to, to identify who she is she could send this to me via an email from uh from an email address from a burner account from an email address uh 1105 at gmail.com right if she sends me that pub that public address i can then send money using from from uh, uh, uh my store of bitcoin i can use my private key to unlock my the reserve mm-hmm. send it to her public address she can then use her private key to unlock that transaction and put it into her reserve of Bitcoin. 
that transaction has to be verified by the Bitcoin miners. And once they get a group of those collections, once they get a, a, a solid collection of those transactions, they want to then put that onto the uh, uh, next link in the chain, right? And if they can do that, that's what creates Bitcoin. We are at, I believe, 18 million, 18 uh, million plus Bitcoin right now. And there's only 21 million, right? So eventually, it's all going to be gone. It's all going to be gone. And now people are going to put value onto this Bitcoin because right now, as you guys see, the demand for Bitcoin is increasing. Price going up. Price went up. I feel like it's, two years ago, it was like seven grand and mm-hmm. now it's like 50 grand. Yep. And so, you know, we, we compare Bitcoin back to real estate and we compare Bitcoin back to stock. Yes, Bitcoin will be a currency in the sense that it will be a medium right a way of which we uh, exchange exchange for goods and services exchange for goods for goods and services yes but it will also be a fixed asset that we can hold over time to be able to you know put in our wills or uh, uh um use to um uh, uh increase it's our another increase asset our net worth that that, it, that is fixed it's a fixed asset and it appreciates over time so different than real estate right different than real estate because you know we may start to go um, colonize Mars, and so mm. maybe that that uh, one million dollar house that sits in Beverly Hills is no longer worth the land that it's on. Now you can get a, you can get a Beverly Hills house for a hundred thousand dollars, because now those people have now moved to Mars. Right? Bitcoin is only twenty one million. There's no more that's going to be made. Okay. And before we move to the next topic, I'm I'm gonna finish. I'm gonna finish with this. Money. Money, three characteristics. It needs to be durable, difficult to obtain, and once it meets those two factors, we need to put a value to it. Everything that we have always used for money has met those three factors. Bitcoin is doing the same thing, just in a digital format, right? So I'm, I'm not saying put your whole life savings into Bitcoin. I'm not saying that. I'm saying look at cryptocurrency as an, in, an innovative technology that can be very, very good for our world currency structure, not just the United States. And so, you know, we'll have more conversations about that topic specifically, because that's a little thick, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a little thick, but, you know. Yeah, uh, the global reserve yes, currency, yeah. that I think that's a little further down the line than people are ready for right yes. now. So information has been withheld from us. We are here to give your opinions on the information that we are consuming, right? And so um, with our experience in the market, with things that, that, that we go through and the conversations that we have with other people, we want to share this information with you. So by no means are we experts in the financial field. Um, but we are Encouraging people to yeah. find out information for yourselves. Yes. Read, 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 and absorb as much information as you can. Um, The best thing we can do for our society is be informed citizens um, in every aspect. So technology is going to touch every part of our lives. So we got to we got to get hip to it. And I think, um, you know, uh, as as we move into our next topic um, about Clubhouse, the the difficulties that you guys are seeing with Clubhouse right now, if you're paying, if you're paying attention, um, are dealing with privacy. Okay. And so the link between uh, what we were talking about before with uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain mm-hmm. and, and, and cryptocurrency is our ability to be able to uh, do work with other people from around the world. And still maintain our privacy. And still that's, main, that's key. Yes. And still maintain Encryption our privacy. Encryption is important in maintaining your privacy. 1,000%. And so... We talked about encryption before in our previous uh, uh, our previous podcast our previous podcast episode one, and with that encryption in the blockchain, right? We talk about that that public key. That public key keeps your identity private, keeps you discreet as you're moving through the blockchain and doing these transactions, um, and moving your Bitcoin around or cryptocurrency around. These nodes, as we talked about before with the Bitcoin miners, everyone has a computer. And these computers are all over the world, whether it be in the United States, whether it be in Russia, whether it be in Argentina, Australia, China, China, right? They're everywhere. But because the information is encrypted, 
and everybody can see what's going on uh, on the chain, right? Because all of us have a copy of what's going on concurrently. It, it keeps everything open, but it keeps us private. It and it keeps, keeps us secure. Secure, but it's efficient. The privacy issues that Clubhouse is coming into are the issues with their encryption. And <laughs> Lack they, thereof. <laughs> <laughs> and that they are using um, servers based in other countries. There, there are ways that they could have prevented this. And so I'll, I'll let Sarah talk about um, what's uh, going on, what's going on, and how uh, you know if you are a user of Clubhouse, how this might be affecting you. Okay, so it's as Clubhouse has grown in you know their user base has expanded. They have been faced with the issue of where they store their user data. So we're talking about servers. Um, so they selected a cheaper company based in China. I'm saying cheaper, but just less expensive to what would be available here in the States, which would be Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided to go with a Chinese based company, Agora, I believe. Agora. And uh, the, they're not encrypting their user data um, and they're also collecting audio. So how Clubhouse works is they have these different rooms that people join the room and they have discussions and stuff. Um, and Clubhouse records the audio from all of those rooms. Now in their privacy policy, they could do that. Like you agreed to that when you sign on to Clubhouse. But the fact that they're not encrypting their um, the data mm -hmm. means that somebody, a hacker, could break into the system and do, you know, wreak havoc, do whatever they want to do with that data. And that has happened, you know, since it came out that Clubhouse may not necessarily have a secure system to protect their user data. Um, there was an unidentified user that entered a room on Clubhouse, hijacked the audio stream and streamed it to an external website. Um, and it went on for quite some time before Clubhouse was able to patch that, you know, particular hack. But Clubhouse is recording that audio anyway and storing it. So who's to say, you know, like if you're having sensitive conversations on Clubhouse, you want to be aware that Clubhouse is recording all of those conversations. Under In their privacy policy, it's framed for the purpose of... Um, how to say it to like settle disputes like if yeah if so if, if something happens if in something the room. happens in the room where um maybe there's racist content or there's bigotry or you know just something that is negative on the platform that audio can be then uh looked at and scrubbed and, and they can address it the the issue though is that uh they say that if there's no uh if that there's no notice that there was an issue with the audio then that is deleted uh, okay. after a certain time. However, they do say that if uh, there is a notice, they do keep that audio. The issue is they don't tell you how long they keep the audio and who has access how to the it's audio and how thereafter. Right, right. There, there, there's no uh, description of that. Um, another kind of like sore point around privacy in Clubhouse is that. When you, as a user, sign up, um, you get like two invites that you can send to somebody in your contacts. However, Clubhouse uploads your entire contact list. So if I choose not to be on Clubhouse, but people who I know are on Clubhouse, my information is already being collected by Clubhouse by way of my phone. Whatever is attached to my contact in that person's phone, Clubhouse has that in their database. Mm -hmm. So Clubhouse can, you know, when other people who know me sign on to Clubhouse, it's gonna ask them if they wanna invite me because it sees I already have five people who are on Clubhouse, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're collecting that data as a method for them to rec recruit new users. But I didn't, I did not give Clubhouse permission to have any of my data. Yeah. So that's a problem. You understand? Uh, well, I, 
you did. Yeah, <laughs> no, me. Did. I'm talking about me as a person who did not sign up yet. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Because okay. other people have my cell phone number yes. and email doesn't yes, mean yes, I yes. want Clubhouse to have my cell phone number and email. So I find I find issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just delete your account on Clubhouse mm -hmm. as another point. Um, and let's see, Clubhouse is tracking you by way of cookies, pixels. Wait, and uh, wait, before you go into that, that that's that's really interesting. Why why can't I delete my account on Clubhouse? Why why do I have to call support or? message support to request to, your account be to canceled request my account being canceled why why make it so difficult right i've been so they I can use, continue to store your data yeah so you know you guys have to understand my my perspective of social media i've been using social media since it it came out right back in the myspace <laughs> yeah, high five. <laughs> yeah like <laughs> myspace black planet days right and so now the the levels at which companies are are putting on users to access their data and keep them on platforms, it's just outrageous to me, right? For you to tell me as a user, hey, no, you gotta come talk to me before you delete your account on a platform, on my platform. And there no. are like 10 million users or some some crazy yeah, like that. Yeah, like how do, you, how do you handle that? Like I should be able to delete my information and, and delete it immediately just like I am with other applications. What makes your application so special that i have to go through these means that that's red a point that, yeah yeah that, that's a red flag for me but 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 continue um they can share your personal data without notifying you for you know all these advertisement um sponsorship things um wait but I wait, mean, wait 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 that's not new facebook be doing that all day every day right so <laughs> Get, getting back to the privacy policy guys right just a quick quick note those privacy policies are going to come up when you download an application or you use an application for a time and they need to update it. it's going to come up with a little a little window right you have to press accept and those privacy uh privacy policies terms and conditions are going to tell you how they are going to use your data right again you are the product the app right? is free the app is free for you to use so it's so it's beautiful <laughs> Right. What is it though? But in 2021, you know, I remember my my mom telling me when I was real young, nothing in this world is free. Nothing in this world is free. So while you being able to download the application, use it, talk to your friends, that privacy policy is using your data to be able to make money for the platform that you never see. I'll just leave it at that. Next. Um, the last point would be Clubhouse is tracking its users via cookies, pixels, and other tracking technologies um, to monitor their movement across the web. Hmm. I assume this is also going to be to drive ad, you know, to collect data to drive ads as well. That's well one, it, it keeps falling back into ad revenue. That's how 1, these companies make their money. The app is free, but they're making money off of ads by collecting their use, the user data. Yes. And so uh, uh, Clubhouse is at a pivotal point right now because it's been a free application. And just like a lot of other free applications, you know, Twitter, Twitter had a for a long time. And I think it's still really trying to figure out how to monetize itself, right? Jack Dorsey, um, which we'll get to Jack in just a minute. Um, Jack Dorsey, uh, the CEO of Twitter, started Twitter as just a platform for people to uh, express themselves in 140 characters. That platform was funded by investors because of the multitude of people who use Twitter. Twitter has been free since it came out. But Jack Dorsey is one of the richest people in, in the country, if not the world right now, right? So what, what makes these platforms so valuable? Why? It's the users. Clubhouse is now uh, valued at, I believe, a billion dollars. That's the last, last I heard. How is this company valued at a billion dollars and it hasn't sold a thing? its users oh it sold quite a few things actually <laughs> so now that the investors were able to fund a platform that was able to amass a large following 
now they can start to accumulate all of that data from these users and start to call these advertising companies. Hey, I have 100 million people on this app. What's good? What's going on? I'll sell each one to you uh, for 50 cents. And you can you can market your uh, uh, new drink or your new pair of shoes on the app for two weeks, right? That's how that works. So Clubhouse is now at a point where they are trying to figure out how to monetize themselves. And if we go back to the conversation we had in episode one about how, uh, especially Apple users in iOS 14, that you, uh, beforehand, you weren't really knowledgeable about what information was being tracked about you. Now, that information is going to be more transparent, right? You're going to be, you're gonna have to act more on if you want these companies to track you or not. And so these companies know that, so they're taking preemptive, preemptive steps to try to avoid you denying them tracking you, such as telling me I can't delete my account by myself, I have to call you, or hey, I can't invite more people because I it, unless I upload my whole contact list. I don't like it. Things to think about. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up Jack Jack Dorsey real quick. Um, another role model of mine. You guys are gonna have to excuse where we're here in the shop recording uh, right here by the street. So, um, talking about Jack Dorsey uh, and his recent deal to acquire uh, a majority stake in Title. Title is a music streaming service that has been more for the support of paying artists what they're due. And I bring all of this to say, uh, uh, bring it back to Bitcoin as a wrap up. There are a lot of technologies that are being built right now that are, are built in innovation and trying to compensate people for their work. The collaboration between Jay-Z and Tidal and Jack Dorsey, who is not only the owner of, uh, uh, owner of Twitter, but is also the owner of Cash App and Square. Um, these two coming to have a conversation about how artists are paid um, from labels or the methods in which they release their content to monetize, uh, I think them having this conversation and, and Jack investing into title show signs that there's going to be something, something new to come um, from how people are valuing art and how they will be able to pay for art. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, excuse me, Jack has also invested, uh, I wanna say 50 million plus in uh, Bitcoin, uh, his um, him and Elon, I believe Jack only in his the only word in his uh, bio. Is it's Bitcoin. just Bitcoin. It's this just is, this is Bitcoin. <laughs> That's right? it. Um, the conversation that I have with my colleague, uh, there are the traditional investors who are who look at Bitcoin as um, as an issue, as a problem as something that... To rival gold. To rival gold, yes. As something that should be... Or even displace it, which is just wild to me. Yeah, yeah. And it, and, and, and they feel that it's um, people like Jack, people like Elon, people like Jeff Bezos, people like Mark Zuckerberg, who are just fueling the idea that Bitcoin is worth something that it's not really worth anything. But that these people are fueling it because they want to get rich off of it. They're trying to game the system. Right, they're trying to game, like game the system. Well, my rebuttal to that would be, you know, the people that put value on gold and silver, the, the, the central banks are doing the people same are thing. People the stock markets. They're doing, they're doing the same exact thing. It's, it's just so that with Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, we can see it. Everybody has a transparent view of what's going on. There's not it's one decentralized. person. decentralized. Exactly. There's not one person that controls this. And so, um, you know, those are the things that I look at cryptocurrency as. Uh, being something that is worth the time of looking into and worth the time of putting some of your net worth into, um, if I'm being honest. 
um, sort of wrap up. Um, thank you guys for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to us, um, Joshua, uh, the genius at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach out to us through our website as well at www.joshuathegenius.com. Um, and for our members uh, of the Virgin Islands, uh, you, of course, you guys can see us here in the store. Um, I am an Apple tech. We work on all Apple printed uh, products here in the store, iPhones, iPads, Mac computers, um, anything with an Apple logo on it. So if you guys need any help, reach out to us, 340-227-3821. We're right here um, in the heart of Main Street, um, in the heart of downtown Charlotte Amaya, uh, right off the road, same, uh, same road where Crazy Cow used to be, uh, right across from Stonehouse Cafe and right above Valentine's Jewelers. Um, so guys, yeah, thank you guys for listening and watching. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a good day. Peace.